had 106 registrants, and yesterday the place was all full, and I was wondering who were going to be the remaining few here. The, uh, all right, a shout out to all of you. Thank you for staying with us for the entire conference. Uh, that's truly meaningful because um, uh, we've got, I mean, you've heard some of our other keynotes. Um, Lois yesterday, Jill yesterday, and uh, Dave's unbelievable uh, presentation, uh, entertainment this morning, Michael Morris. And um, I called up a good friend of mine, and I said, Ted, I need a good closer. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so after that, um, uh, Ted and I spoke, and um, he's done something like this for me before. Uh, our friendship is just incredible, and it is my true honor and privilege to invite Ted Zeller up here uh, to give us our final words of wisdom before we close out the California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference 2023. Mr. Ted Zoller. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would be nowhere else than right here at this moment due to Alex and Noble. Alex is really one of the champions of our, uh, I don't know how we can go on without you. In fact, we're not going to go on without you, Alex. You're never retiring. Uh, <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Re retired entrepreneur professors, just they just fade away. You know, it's one of those things, right? So um, I, I'm going to aim for a bit of entertainment. I was going to start out by saying I'm going to work through a deep empirical analysis and show you a hypothesis, and, and that's what we're going to do. But we're not going to do that. Um, I've been really interested. I'm going to tell you a story, kind of a story that's been multi, multiple years. I've been working on a program to understand the dynamics of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial leadership. Now, it's different than managerial leadership. And I've done a number of things. And I presented uh, some of that work in this uh, program before. But it's all in one kind of pathway to understand how do we encourage and prepare people to make the transition to entrepreneurship. And all of us are working in the field. Our goal is to prepare people to make that transition. And uh, many of our uh, trainees don't make that transition, have you noticed? Uh, some of them go on to jobs, which is fine, right? In fact, very natural and normal. In fact, there's a life cycle to it. Uh, but um, uh, some of them never make that transition to entrepreneurship. They may have an entrepreneurial mindset. They might think entrepreneurially. I'm sure you've had impact in them. But I have this overall thesis that the potential event energy of entrepreneurship is actually far from realized. Could we double the entrepreneurship rate? Could we increase foundings? And I think this is particularly important now as the platform economy kind of comes forward and people are now being absorbed in the corporate kind of structure. Have you noticed that corporations are getting bigger and small businesses are getting smaller? Uh, and I think that trend is going to continue. So I wanted to kind of encourage a countervailing kind of approach. I call it the gumption project. And you know, this is a word that I want to break it down. And you see, it's extraordinary, ordinary entrepreneurs everywhere, because I believe entrepreneurism is a democratized model. And if we democratize it completely, make it fully available to every community, we're going to increase uh, entrepreneurship rates. That's the idea. So I'm going to work you through kind of some building blocks. And at its core, it's this word gumption, you know? And I want to just put something on the table. So everyone heard this word. I literally listen. Whenever I hear a podcast or something on entertainment, oh, what does it take to get through the entrepreneurial process? And sure enough, they reference Angela Duckworth. And I don't dispute that. I think grit is part of the process. You have to grind. You have to be resilient. You have to be able to kind of process the, the, the um, pain in many ways. But, you know, it's a necessary, in my mind, but not sufficient condition to understand the entrepreneurial emergence. Entrepreneurial emergence involves a commitment. It's a moment you make the decision to burn the ships at the shore. You're going for something that no one else will do. It is the ultimate of courage, right? And we don't have a word for that, really. Well, we actually do have a word for that, and it's a word we've lar largely left behind in the slag heap of, uh, of uh, anachronisms. And that would be the word gumption. So let's lay, lay, lay this out. I'm just curious, what would your 
you might be thinking right now, ah, oh, the word gumption, it's a little old fashioned, you know, it's something, you know, your granddad might have said, or, you know, you think about the people who's going across the, the, the plains right now, and, you know, we're going to get some gumption and get some sarsaparilla after that, um, right? But what, what does this word mean to you? Can I ask you all just to share with me your, your perceptions? And I've got a hot mic here. I always like going, especially with a professor from Mexico, because I love, and gumption is an American word. It's an American word. To my mind, uh, Forrest Gump. You know. Forrest Gump. Forrest, Forrest Gump is you got some gumption. Forrest Gump. How about you? What's gumption? N never heard. I have no idea. no idea. That's pretty common. I talk to people from overseas. They have no idea what is gumption. It doesn't translate, right? Isn't that cool though that it doesn't translate? Does it? Uh, how many of you would say you're American? You, you grew up in America. How many of you feel like you know the word gumption? Is it a word you're comfortable with? Yeah, okay. Okay, I'm prepared to hear this. But, I mean, is it a word we can redefine and recapture just for us? Is it a word that we can keep? It's a word, let me, I'm going to make you fall in love with the word gumption. Let me, let me tell you why. You know, it's funny. This is a quote. It says, guts, grit, and gumption are, were once the, the core basis of the American dream. Uh, it sounds like the American dream is over. Uh, you know, there's great conversations. Believe it or not, Michael Milken right now is creating the Institute for the creation of the American dream. He bought 400,000 square feet of office space within a chip shot of the White House with a penthouse overlooking the White House. And there's going to be a museum called the Milken uh, Institute for the American dream there overlooking the White House. And he put together a group of people and you know the first reaction was, geez, the American dream's not available to everyone. The American dream is something that hasn't been realized. The American dream is largely dead. And you know, I hear, I hear that, but I'm not convinced by that, because I think what makes America unique is something that is at its core about gumption. We were never given tools. We're an immigrant nation. We're a nation of people that were never given many opportunities. We had to climb and scr scratch and, and try to build that, that, to capture that opportunity. And that's something that in the United States we have actually nurtured by not creating a lot of barriers to it. You know, if there was someone in Austria, for instance, who had gumption, they'd have to go check with four or five offices before they'd go do something. Whereas in the U.S., of course, you can get started. You know, we actually um, celebrate people who fail, right? Well, anyways, I knew I was onto something when Nick Offerman came out with a book, and literally this is one of the worst days of my life because I believe it or not, I've trademarked the word because I want to spend some time bringing the word gumption back. And I trademarked the word, but then someone said, have you seen Nick Offerman's book, Gumption? I'm like, oh God, it is the worst book I've ever read. I swear he narrated in his phone. I'm not shitting you. Uh, uh, it's actually a really sweet idea, and he talks about kind of uh, people, cultural change makers, um, which I, I think is a nice way to think about it. But, um, you know, when I think about gumption, there's several, several preconceptions. Throw them out. What are your preconceptions of the word? Throw them out. Just yell them out. One word. Rashness. What? Rashness. Rashness. Brashness. Being brash. Yeah. Nerve. Nerve. Nerve and verve, I've heard. Gutsy. 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 Steadfast. Steadfast. Someone who's, like, focused. Any other words? Stick to it. Stick to itness, right? Of course, and that's more grit, I, th I think. Um, okay, so these are words that kind of capture the imagination. And actually, did an empirical analysis, of an, an engram analysis, to look at the use of the word and how the word has kind of taken shape linguistically over time. But it's interesting. I'm really interested in these these words: grabbing the brass ring, harnessing serendipity, taking the leap, fortune versus luck. It's it's about taking action, right? Um, and I would argue that the word, if you look at the Merriam-Webster dictionary, dictionary or the Oxford Abridged Dictionary, that would be the lexicon of the English language, they talk about uh, gumption as initiative, aggressiveness, resourcefulness, courage, spunk, guts, common sense, shrewdness. It's fascinating to me, though, the original definition of the word, it came over with Scottish immigrants in around 1840 to the United States. It was largely used in an American context, but it actually has roots in linguistics in, uh, in Scotland. And it meant someone who was wildly pragmatic, always purposeful, knowing what to do at the right time for the right reason, highly pragmatic. 
But that doesn't capture the way we think of the word now, does it? Because gumption means a little bit offbeat, someone who's a little unorthodox, someone who's against the grain, someone who defies conventional wisdom, right? So in the, in the late 20th century, we added this eccentricity kind of element. So how do you combine pragmatism and unconventional thought, or pragmatism and eccentricity? But when you talk about entrepreneurism, isn't there something eccentric about entrepreneurs? Are entrepreneurs conventional people? Aren't entrepreneurs a little weird? You know, we're a little neurodiverse. A little bit crazy. A little bit crazy. And it's OK to be a little crazy. Don't we have to celebrate that little bit of unconventionality, right? Isn't that what is what gets us excited? I hope I'm talking to you. Because you know, entrepreneurism is about putting something out that's rendering visible something that doesn't exist. That is a pure form of entrepreneurism. So there you go. So there have been a number of linguistic changes. The first recorded use was Scottish immigrants in the early 19th century. It was associated with Western expansion as someone who's practical, can-do attitude. Can-do, that's another one. Uh, during the use of the turn, turn of the century, it was reclaimed uh, as part of the immigration experience for those who stake their own claim. You know, uh, uh, Think about the impact of immigration in the United States. This is why I, I think anyone who starts to frame this as American exceptionalism is coming at it from the standpoint that there are Americans. But who are Americans? We're all immigrants. We're all immigrants. It's embedded in the immigrant experience, as a matter of fact. And that's one thing that's distinctive about this country. It is a melting pot of many cultures. I don't think it's a society. You know, we could have a long conversation about that. But you know, what really brought this about was this counterintuitive or unconventional thought around direct action. How can I make something that doesn't exist? How do I defy the norms that are already there and combine it with just do it pragmatism? So I did an n-gram analysis of the use of the word over time. And I'm going to have to point this out. But there were four grand periods of gumption in the United States, starting from the year 1800 all the way to uh, where I could get n-gram to finish, which was 2018. There were four major crises events. Uh, uh, in, well, there were several crises events, but there were s several key events in uh, human history during this period of time. Most of them are the core events that you could remember. Like, for instance, in 1836, roughly, there was a massive uh, economic the Teapot Dome scandal, uh, the Civil War, uh, the, the, the uh, Depression, uh, World War I, World War II. Uh, and when you look at this uh, graphic, this is the GDP per capita in billions. Uh, the red is overall GDP in billions, and gumption usage is the green line over time. What do you notice right around 1944? Gumption use declined. What was happening in 1945 and 1946 and 1947? The US was a superpower, kind of unchallenged, so we didn't see ourselves as kind of giving ourselves a better loser. But we were highly corporate, weren't we? We had everything was in big scale. Everyone was part of a large organization. This was the era of IBM. This was the era of 3M. This was the era of GE, right? It wasn't the era of entrepreneurism. It's fascinating. We were part of a bigger system, in our mindset at least. But I would argue there were four golden ages of gumption. It was the period post-revolutionary to the first major economic failure. And then uh, right before the Civil War, right after the Civil War, and then from 1962 forward, this is the period of time when economic freedom actually increased. And I would argue that the use of the word uh, gumption also increased exponentially, but I don't think our actions have followed our linguistics. I don't believe that there is, uh, and if you look at startup rates and how startup rates have unfolded, there's been as much of a change in the use and worth, um, excuse me, the um, outcomes in entrepreneurism. I don't think we're, how many of you feel like we're realizing our potential? as an entrepreneurial economy. Anyone saying we're optimized? We, as many, we have as many entrepreneurs as we need? Come on, t talk to me. No. no. You know, are we far away from that? Yeah, I think we are pretty far away from that. Do you think we have potential yet to realize? I believe that's the case. But, you know, when you talk to young people, 
I wish this data, I could do a hyper analysis of 2016 to 2025. This is the data I wish I could get. And it's difficult because this data is actually compiled, believe it or not, now by Google. Uh, the lexicon now of the uh, English language is now Google, um, <laughs> which is hilarious. Um, but, you know, um, for the, do we have any Gen Zs in here? Anybody who is a youngster? Any youngsters in here? Yeah, you wish. <laughs> you're going to have another, you're, rena you're in a renaissance period. But the, the truth of the matter is, um, young people have gone through several crises. What are the crises they've experienced? The 2009 financial crisis, right? The pandemic. What else? <laughs> and a lot of questions around how society works. Young people do not take chances because they're not rewarded for taking those chances. In fact, they like to kind of stay tucked in. And I've, I'm really worried about the future of entrepreneurism because the psychology of a young person is go find a stable job. What else is happening that's instrumental to a young person's life? What? Social media. Social media, certainly, and learning just-in-time learning is a key issue. But I was thinking more of their economic experience. <laughs> the cost of education has skyrocketed. Student debt is highest. Housing. Housing is unattainable. We're creating a renter's generation right now. And people are not incented to take risk. What does that bode for the future of the American economy? Pretty poor futures ahead of us. So um, I want to try to create the, uh, and by the way, I have a really wonky kind of thing I'm going to be doing. The book comes out in the fall. Um, uh, I've, I've actually tied it to uh, philosophical bulwarks that were largely European-based, uh, first starting with utilitarianism, if you know John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham, and then moving on to pragmatism, which is a uniquely American uh, philosophy. If you are any philosophy kind of people, John Dewey really defined the concept of pragmatism, which is associated with the American experience. So if you dig into the American dream, I would submit to you that has to do with the fact that we are all immigrants and that we all had to kind of create our own opportunities. And we live in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment where government is not highly regulating us, right? We have some economic freedom. Now, that's a great, that is the American dream. I think if we can keep it, I'm not sure we're in the trend line that we're gonna be able to keep it. That's just my personal opinion. I wish I could show you data. So when I did the engram analysis, these are the words that really came up that are associated with gumption. Knack, resourcefulness, persistence, pragmatism, savvy, sense, determination, perseverance, go-getting. You know, and ultimately it's the ability to decide what is the best thing to do in a particular situation to do with energy and determination. And I would argue eccentricity to a certain extent. Um, and you know, these are the words that kind of come up. Now, you know, I started out by saying Angela Duckworth has coined the word grit. Everyone's talking about grit. You know, that's a trap, grit's a trap, because it, uh, many people um, can spend their lives, you know, executing grit and never getting anywhere. It could be a painful life, right? But if you don't decide to make the decision with gumption, you probably aren't gonna have a very exciting life. Your life will largely be pretty boring. Um, I would also argue that in this project that I'm looking at, it's been a six year project basically, where I've looked at different phases of the entrepreneurial process. I wanted to look at the characteristics and differentiators of entrepreneurial leaders to understand their personal development. So how do we develop them? And it's based on a couple of assumptions. So I'm, I was aiming for entertainment. Am I being entertaining? Yes. Okay, good. All right, I'm aiming at that. All right, let me break down these uh, six things and don't worry about it. I'm not gonna do all of them. I'm just gonna combine a couple. But the, f the first one is really important. And that's, you know, we keep on talking about the entrepreneurial mindset. And I'm gonna move very quickly because I'm dealing with a bunch of educators. You all can teach this. It's not anything I'm gonna tell you that you don't already know. But when we look at entrepreneurial mindset, I find that to be a wholly unsatisfactory term because it's too wide, it's uncharacterized, it's not very well defined. What is the entrepreneurial mindset? You know, it's a whole basket of things, you know. Uh, Jeff Hornsby, who, who's, who's been a colleague of mine in this project, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff would break it down into 15 different pieces, you know, from a psychological standpoint. A mindset is difficult to quantify, right? But I would argue that we could deconstruct it a bit uh, with gumption. You know, uh, this is the uh, definition from Miriam Webster, one who organizes and manages and assumes the risk of a business or enterprise. Boy, wouldn't that excite you to be an entrepreneur? 
But there's a word in there that called out risk. The word is risk. Gumption is the tool that means you assume risk. All right, uh, it comes from two loan words from, Fran from French. Um, uh, the word entre, which means enter, between, among, or ponder, to take or to capture. An entrepreneur is someone who is between, who captures. They're not the inventor. They are the people that integrates uh, uh, multiple innovations. Innovation, by the way, and I detest the fact that people will make innovation a synonym of entrepreneurship. Innovation is a sister of entrepreneurship. It is inexorable. Innovation must be used, but it is not the same. Because an innovator is someone who will ultimately find the right path. An entrepreneur will take it to human use. They're practical. Um, Schumpeter was the one who really kind of, uh, originally Cantillon was the one who defined entrepreneurship as someone who basically takes a risk in order to make a return. Right? It was a very simple economic concept. But it was then uh, refined by Schumpeter who talked about entrepreneurship as the gale of creative destruction. What does an entrepreneur do? They basically uh, define a counter narrative. They define something that works against the grain, right? They actually define something that is defying current conventional wisdom. Uh, and then, obviously, Gifford Pinchot came back with the idea of intrapreneurship, and, and we have now a national expert who's now defining this in corporate entrepreneurship. We have several in this room, as a matter of fact. Uh, someone who uh, can do entrepreneurship within an existing organization. Totally believe in this. I've seen it. An organization that was comprised completely of entrepreneurs is an organization in havoc. So it's fascinating. You know, a big organization needs operators as well. And then Harvard's definition of entrepreneurship is, um, this is something I appreciate. It's a, it's a person who recognizes opportunities over time and can marshal resources and organizations as the context changes. So the market is the evolving piece. You know? And I don't usually fawn over Harvard, but they get this right. The market is a changing a a mechanism. There's not that aha moment. Because you can spend your whole life looking for that unattainable aha moment, and it will be assumed the next day. You know, I, I quarrel with disruption, as a matter of fact, because I think the market is going to always respond. It's amazing how the half-life of information is, is accelerating with the, with the web and what we're seeing now. Anyways, Howard Stevenson, my favorite definition, entrepreneurship is a pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources currently controlled. You've got to appreciate that. Why is this a liberating statement? It goes into gumption, by the way, because one of the first cop-outs among your students is, I'm not starting a business because I don't, have the, I don't have resources, I don't have the idea. You know, it goes beyond that. I don't have the knowledge, I don't have the skills, I don't have the experience. I call this the six layers of gumption. Um, so why are we in this business? It's where values, mission, and vision can be brought together. And many of you are inspired by this idea of that future pathway, but you know that entrepreneurship is, is an experimental model. There is not a linear function in entrepreneurism. In my experience, there is no direct point from A to B. Uh, in fact, uh, we, in the previous conversation, people were talking about kind of the quick buck kind of form of entrepreneurship that's evolving with venture capital and so forth. You know, entrepreneurship is fundamentally about experimentation, and most people, you know, learn through failing, right? That's, let's get real. Now, when we talk about who's an entrepreneur, these are the people that come up, right? And what's wrong with this picture? And by the way, I'm spending almost all my time with Gumption attacking this vision of entrepreneurship. Because entrepreneurism is everywhere. I will submit to you, and I can show you empirically, no kidding with my research, that Silicon Valley is controlled by 36 people. 36 people. And about two thirds of them are money people. And about a third of them are innovators. And now the billionaire effect and the PayPal mafia and so forth are kind of playing out. But that is one form of entrepreneurism and suboptimizes the potential of American in any economy's uh, potential as an economic powerhouse. And by the way, I have a couple weird ones up here because you probably wouldn't have put these dudes up here, but does anyone know who the, they are? I bet everyone knows who they are. That's Hewlett and Packard in front of the garage. And that's actually on the list of, that crappy garage is on the list of historic places. Isn't that cool? Does anyone know this dude? He was a Hungarian. Andy Grove, total son of a bitch. And he was one of the smartest darn guys. And he was one, somebody who said, you know, Silicon Valley's not doing anything worthwhile. Did you read his blog right before he died? He was angry. He's like, what are you doing, search? Facebook? This is innovation? 
He's like, I miniaturized the silicon, uh, you know, the memory chip. What have you done? You know, he had an edge to his, his thought. But, you know, I dispute, and by the way, it's really easy to, it, you know, I, I'm sorry, this is almost too easy, right? What, white men, old white men. Who am I? I'm an old white man. Does that mean I'm not, you know, worthwhile? No, I'm, I'm worthwhile. But, you know, we do have a prototype that's kind of playing out here. You know, that's not healthy. And, you know, I, I love to show pictures like this to kind of just, just look at one form of diversity, uh, uh, gender diversity, which is a horrible problem. And we have to think about the different ways that um, people on the other side of the gender equation form companies. But I would also submit to you one other key form of diversity we need to look at is neurodiversity. Because I believe entrepreneurs think differently, you know? Uh, it's funny, the two call signs, the two mottos of two of the biggest brands in the United States, I think summarize entrepreneurship better than everything. Like, think different, that's Apple, right? And just do it, which is Nike. Put those two together, that's entrepreneurship. By the way, that's gumption. Um, I celebrate someone like Hamdi Okalia. Uh, everyone know his story? Great story. Uh, Turkish guy, he came here with very little money. This actually relates to my family because I come from eight generations of dairy farmers from upstate New York. And my family helped to build the co-ops that processed milk and, and created cheese and milk products and cottage cheese in upstate New York, one of the biggest belts of um, agriculture, I think. But you know, for years, my, my ancestors and my father and my grandfather and my brother even were like, you can't get ahead. You know, the world is never going to take care of you. You know, government will never let you make any money. And they, they um, ran, you know, basically couldn't make the business work. And, you know, now we're out of the dairy business. But we had this huge enterprise, this co-op that we built that processed milk. And they became more corporate and, and so forth. And Hamdi came in and said, we have all this capacity to source fluid milk in one place. And it's undervalued. And I... I wonder if people like Greek yogurt. And he introduced a whole new concept, took over that co-op, produced his first set, and now almost all of the people that helped build that co-op will become millionaires when this company IPOs, and probably will never IPO, who knows. But um, uh, it's a fascinating story. Um, and he came here with nothing. And he reconceptualized generations of people that had been here for hundreds of years, couldn't figure out. Yeah, you gotta celebrate that. Now, is he any more American than I am, coming from seven generations of people? No. I mean, he's just as much an American as I am. Um, he probably also, if you've met him, you would say, he's weird. He's weird. He's different. He thinks differently. Um, these are the people that I celebrate. Um, these are students that started from nothing, that have gone on to do things, and they're people from all sorts of different walks of life. I could tell you some hair-raising stories. These are people that came out of my classes, believe it or not. And now I'm old enough that I'm starting to see these folks make great wealth. And it's such a privilege just to have been part of this equation over two and a half decades, three decades of work, uh, to see these people actually generate wealth. And they're generating it based on no financial engineering, just being creative in value creation and being focused. This guy, I love this guy, Ryan Stone, he's the least likely entrepreneur I'd ever meet. Ryan Stone was a naval submariner, engineer, nuclear engineer. He worked in a utility when I met him. He, met, he worked in the electric company when I met him. And he said, Ted, I've got this great idea. I remember the first class, I got this great idea. I want to start an airline. And I was like, oh shit. That's the worst idea. I mean, it's, it's a regulated market. It's, it's been done. No one can make money. Blah, blah, blah. He goes, no, 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 you're wrong. I've got a business model that will change the way things are done. I want to go to corporates that are running jet fleets, and I want to do a managed service to run all their jet fleets. And I know one particular case. I know of one company that really needs this because they're doing an aviation department when they're a steel company, and that was Nucor Steel doing micro bills, mills to build steel. And he said, I'm gonna to go to them and I'm gonna tell them that I wanna run all their fleet and I don't want any of the, the, you keep the planes, I'll provide you Top Gun level pilots and I'll source the pilots and run the aviation department and I'm gonna also sign a deal that you can fire me in a day's notice. If there's a, ever a safety, 100% safety and I can be fired immediately. And the, new, um, the guy, the CEO of um, Nucor Seal said, great. That business model was killer because none of the assets were on the balance sheet. He didn't have to buy a plane. 
he could manage it on behalf. And then as soon as uh, the 2009 crisis came in and the GM folks started flying into uh, Teterboro Airport with their fancy planes, uh, and, they, and GM got all this heat for having a big private aviation, his phone was ringing off the hook. He was running almost every corporate aviation department in, in, among big companies in the country. There was kind of a niche that he was figuring out. He, it became Da Vinci Gents, he sold it uh, to NetJets. Now he's doing Smart Sky, which is going to provide high-speed internet for civil aviation, and it's going to be a game changer. But least likely person, but he proved himself to have gumption. Um, uh, another person I would celebrate, uh, Amit Singh. He's another very unlikely entrepreneur. <laughs> Amit, Amit is uh, from India, and Amit came to me, and he uh, is an engineer, and he said, uh, you know, I want to get into the or outsourcing business. I'm like, really? Citrix, you know, we got, I mean, we have all these great outsourcing, Infosys, you know, we have, we have uh, 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 Wipro, we have all these great outsourcers from India. He said, no, 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 we, we can compete. I'm going to build development teams that can operate as the sun goes around the earth. So I'm going to have development teams working around the earth, and I'll speed up development cycles. And he's got the fastest growing organic growth, owns 100% of the company right now, and I would submit to you he's probably the richest person in North Carolina pound for pound for the time he's been around. Uh, the richest person is probably the Epic Games guy, which is a financial arbitrage deal. And the second richest person would be Jim Goodnight, who runs SAS, the second largest private company. So I can't really compare him, because he was just a kid when those people were starting. Um, Amit has built an organic growth business model that just blew me away. And by the way, I could never have picked him. I would never have been able to predict it. So I just want to get out of the way. This is the way I see our students. We have to realize the potential, what gumption can do for their lives, and give them those tools. Do not pick winners and losers, because that's not our job. Okay, let me go to the next level. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit of this or move very quickly, because I've only got 12 minutes. Um, this word is why we're in the business, right? There's a lot of opportunity. But there are also words that are pretty important. Passion plays a big piece of it. But there are other downsides, right? There's a word like failure. And all of us kind of recognize how important failure is. And then there's the word success. And I defy you to come up with one definition, right? You have a group of 50 students, there'll be 50 definitions of success. But I think we're missing one word, and this is the word I hate the most, because luck has nothing to do with entrepreneurship. Timing, timing is something you can't control. It has everything to do with entrepreneurship. But luck is, is a cop-out, because I believe great entrepreneurs prepare themselves to make that journey. And I look at luck as a function of almost like what Louis Pasteur said, chance favors a prepared mind. It's a function of preparation. I believe gumption's a function of preparation, preparing yourself to make that step. And Western philosophy has largely forgotten this. You know, when we type the words fortune into the Google search engine, Vanna White comes up. I mean, how embarrassing is that, right? Eastern philosophies have largely captured uh, the notion of fortune. You know, they see it as a much more uh, nuanced thing. I was going through um, the airport in Heathrow, and there was this young lady uh, uh, watching the, um, the, the bags go by, and she was talking to her friend saying, this weekend I'm going to go to the casino and I'm going to blow my whole week's pay on Black 7. I'm going to do it completely at, at the, on, the, on the roulette table. And she wasn't looking at the bags, and I, I, I had that fatherly moment where I pulled, I went behind there, and I said, young lady, come over here for a minute. You haven't looked at any of those bags. And by the way, Black 7 has nothing to do with your future. Keep your money. Because you know that's not going to be the way you're going to get where you want to go. And she was a little bit put off. But I felt like I needed to say that. Because Black 7 has nothing to do with entrepreneurship. Um, Machiavelli probably has the best Western articulation where he talks about fortune as a set of wheels, wheels that turn in different directions and different velocities. And a great entrepreneur is a person who can move from wheel to wheel to wheel. How many of us sit on this wheel and never pull the trigger? Am I speaking to you? This is gumption. It's like when I can finally make the move to jump at the right time, at the right, it's a function of preparation, preparing yourself for that. And by the way, this is the word that's the most fundamental word in our lexicon, in entrepreneurship. What is risk? It's a, it's a, it's a risk. The term risk comes from Arabic. The concept of risk is when you are waiting for something you need to do, is there, but you need to jump to take it. Yes. It comes from, comes from Arabic to Spanish to European language. Really? So you can find this in the book written by German things, so Niklas Luhmann. Oh, great. Can, can, 
I want to treat that. Would, could we talk at the, at the reception? I'll buy you a beer. Uh, Mike Morris has got beer, and I'll give you one of Mike Morris's beers. <laughs> <laughs> So risk is a threshold. It's something that can be calculated. And by the way, you should celebrate people who calculate risk really well. It's the person who calculates risk that never pulls the trigger is the problem. The person without gumption never pulls the trigger. And by the way, you know a lot of those people. So let's go back to this. The other reasons why you don't have gumption are generally skills, knowledge, experience. So you know, I, I work this uh, program called the Entrepreneur's Lab, where actually uh, it's a capstone program for our graduate and undergraduate students, and I get them to really think through the big issues of transitioning to entrepreneurship. And I look at the characteristics, and I'm just going to spend you spend some time. We actually had this apprenticeship program, and when we look at all the characteristics of entrepreneurship, there were five biggies that came up: persistence, drive, passion, resilience, and risk taking. Right. And then when I said, okay, what are the most important skills needed by the entrepreneur? There are a lot of different ones that come up, but the big four are sales, leadership, business development, and the ability to identify market opportunities. And then I asked those same students, what experiences would you seek to be an entrepreneur? And there's a lot of different things that come up, but the big ones are failure, learning something new, enduring hardship, that's grit, working in a startup, networking, and industry knowledge. But failure is a key element, right? Isn't it fascinating? Everyone's been talking about that. So I built that into the equation a bit. And I said, OK, um, students generally don't have gumption coming out of school. Why, why do students, why are students not prepared to uh, start a company immediately after graduating from our programs? Fuel failure, certainly. But actually, most of them are cool because they, uh, we learned from Sarah Sarasvati that uh, Sarah said, you know, it's affordable loss. I, I have nothing to lose. So refer is not really a problem. They think inside the box. They're not prepared to think outside of conventional wisdom. That's true. Student loans. Student loans. Financial reasons, right? There are certainly financial reasons. <laughs> Parents that tell them, go get a job. Because they don't want to live in the basement. We're not hitting the main ones, though. I don't have the skills. I don't have the experiences. I don't have the knowledge. Those are the reasons why people in our, college, our colleges don't make that decision up front. If you notice the kids that do make those decisions, jump out right after graduation or maybe even during graduation and bail out of school, they're super confident. And what they don't know is massive, but they think they know it. It is fascinating, isn't it? Um, anyways, um, I'm going to jump through this, but I looked at the uh, average breakout. It's funny, generationally, we have this Adams Apprenticeship, and the Adams Apprenticeship has a bunch of people in our age group, generally, who are successful entrepreneurs. And we looked at when they broke out, on average, and it was about 12 and a half years after baccalaureate attainment. So you were in your mid-30s when you broke out the first time as an entrepreneur. Uh, that was for the Gen Xs, maybe the early Xs and mid Xs. And then um, when I looked at the grad students who were, you know, end of the millennial, beginning of the Gen Y, probably core of the Gen Y, their breakout period was 6.26 years after baccalaureate attainment. And then when I looked at the, uh, the newer Gen Ys and the early Zs, their breakout were five years. So gumption is increasing in terms of the period that they make that, that transition to entrepreneurship. So you know, maybe they'll be starting businesses in the womb uh, you know, in, in 10 years. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. But you know, I, this is a good sign to a certain extent. But I also wonder whether or not when we look at the net number of new startups, it, things are not improving. We're not really increasing more. So th what we're finding is that the Gen X uh, was more conservative. And then uh, millennials are, are improving the startup rates. And the Gen Zs might go further. But I'm worried about the young Zs right now and the kids who are coming up because they're not making the decisions to go forward. OK, the last piece is the journey, the journey of entrepreneurship. And I, I would argue there's a bit of a myth that entrepreneurship follows a predictable <laughs> career path. I actually thought, thought that it did at, at the beginning. There must be you know, steps you'd learn that you have to take. And I, you know, obviously, I was kind of framed in strategic management. Everything is as a ladder in life. You, know, you look at LinkedIn, everything's a ladder, right? But it has nothing to do with the latter. This is more like entrepreneurship. Um, I call it the roller coaster. Everyone talks about the roller coaster. It's also the tachycardia. Uh, you know, it's a heart attack, man. It is it's intense. And it's fascinating to me that I mapped the, these are different roles. And these are the various uh, senior entrepreneurs. And this was their career path. Do you see any pattern in that data? 
I mean, there is no pattern. I did see one pattern, and that was among a serial entrepreneur, and it looked like a tachycardia. This is the person who founded three companies. Okay, bam, 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 all right, makes sense. Um, and then when I tried to look at the different roles they played, they moved from founder, funder to growth executive consistently. You know, There's not one founder type or one funder type or one growth executive type. They move from role to role to role. So I, I don't think there's a path that looks like this in entrepreneurship. It's a path that looks more like this. It's a path that looks more like this. It's a path that is a lot less linear. So the perception is probably... Um, unlike the reality of entrepreneurship, and I think I'm speaking to the choir in that regard. Um, the other thing I've learned through that work with this cohort of folks over five years is that the breakout is generally um, well after we have them in class. You know, I think we're targeting a breakout period about seven years after baccalaureate attainment plus. So um, we need to look more carefully, and this is kind of one, the green dots are when people make their entrepreneurial move. Um, we need to be thinking about how we look for, uh, you know, being available to, to, to people when they make the decision to go to entrepreneurship. And that's part of the work that I've been work doing now on gumption. And I'm looking at a lifelong model. How many of you are hearing in your schools, we need to go to a lifelong model of education? Yeah, you're hearing it. How many of you believe higher education can make that transition? Yeah, I don't think so. Not so sure. You know, we like degrees. We like tuition. That's pretty ha helpful. You know, I, 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 I just, just wonder, just wonder if we could build a lifelong model of entrepreneurship. We don't belong in the academic structure right now. All of us have, are bastard children. You know, I hate to say it, but entrepreneurship is not a mainstream thing. It's never been a mainstream thing. We've never been in the academy, you know, with the English professor. We're always the kind of the black sheep. Am I speaking to you? You know, so maybe we need to innovate that model. I don't know, I'm saying obnoxious things, I realize. But in many ways, entrepreneurship is a, y, a, a, a X, Y, Z. It's, a, it's an X factor, it's, it's different. So anyways, I wanted to start to map entrepreneurism based on the major events. And I've been looking at gumption as a function of understanding when those events are, are, are happening and then the preparations needed. You know, when we think of the ladders, that's our LinkedIn profile at the bottom. And then these are the major events and the flags are the key milestones. The, Big advances are the green arrows and the big setbacks are the red arrows. And I said, okay, that's kind of a cool way to think about an entrepreneurial career. It's starting to approximate more of the roller coaster function on top of the um, ladder. And my students challenged me. They, they actually talked to one of my students, who, one of my former students who went through this process and actually built kind of a career map of how, how this person's career operated. And that's kind of a cool way of thinking about a person's, you know, Vita. That's a different type of resume, right? We invented this thing. So we started bringing in entrepreneurs and started to understand their journeys. We started building them out as these, these ideas that will be breakouts and setbacks, breakouts and setbacks. Here's a young woman who started the first um, pay-as-you-go restaurant, so a pay-as-you-can restaurant. So there was a major homeless problem in Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, Maggie Kane uh, decided she would open up a restaurant where you pay, pay what you can. So she was taking care of people who couldn't pay. And you notice that a lot of the big events that occurred were after there was major failures in her life. And she had massive success, but over a very concentrated period of time. How did she prepare? So I've been looking at these different people and the different ways that they went about being entrepreneurs. And I challenged my students to think about, is there a way to manage your career in the same way you'd manage a startup? You know, uh, the previous speaker talked about how important it is to have a founder, uh, excuse me, a focus on the jockey and the horse. And he said, over time, my conclusion is spend time on the jockey. Because the jockey really will tell you, you, there are many horses the jockey can ride, but having a great jockey is really what we're aiming at. So can we prepare people ultimately for that intersection? Okay, I have this cool tool that I use called the summoning canvas. I'm not gonna get into it, but basically we help people be aware of what their superpowers are. We try to understand what stepping stones they might do in their lives to prepare themselves. Who, what are their base camps and then what are their summits? And you notice this linear, they could be side hustles, you know, just like climbing mountains, you might have to go to different mountains. And the students go forward and do it, you know, I get them to think about what does success look like, but then break it down into the pieces that your life might ultimately make happen. And here's an example of a young woman who was heading to corporate America and, you know, we basically had her go and do this summoning canvas and she figured out who she was, her superpowers. Uh, she figured out her blind spots, what she wasn't good at. Um, she came up with her brand statement, who she was, and what differentiated her. 
Then she defined how she would project that in her social media and her resume. And then she defined it, uh, that, that projection through her LinkedIn profile. And then she laid out her summoning canvas, what she's good at, her X factors, her experiences, her base camps, and what she wants to do when she grows up. And this isn't, you know, by the way, you probably would predict it in three year cycles, right? And then she said, this is my journey. This is what I've done so far. How is my journey gonna be different to get to those sets of goals? And she bailed on what would have been a career at Deloitte, which now she's doing this startup called Piedmont Pennies. It's a CPG company. And she's happy as a clam. She's the happiest kid I've ever met. And uh, she's living her dreams in many ways. So this is the potential we unlock. And uh, you know, I asked the, the, the folks to go through this. OK, how does this relate to gumption, though? Let's just bring it back. And this is where I'm going to close, because I'm over, aren't I? OK. I look at gumption as the oper oper operationalization of that function of taking the leap, committing to entrepreneurship, making the decision. And there are obvious, you know, and Mike Morris is in the room. Mike has done a lot of academic work in this area. Um, there are many endogenous factors that are around you know, things you can control and exogenous factors that are environmental that, sh that you can't control. But I believe that uh, entrepreneurs uh, do grab the brass ring at some point, and, and those who don't just let opportunity pass by. So we started this gumption project with the idea of understanding the behavior and context of taking entrepreneurial risk. And this is something I've enrolled my students in over the last three years. And, and uh, uh, Jeff Hornsby also uh, introduced to a cohort of his students and involved uh, interviewing a number of entrepreneurs. And the basic principle behind the concept is that we're at the intersection where opportunity recognition meets awareness and preparation. So can we equip students with enough preparation that they can take it to the next level? And that the potential for gumption exists in virtually everyone, but few possess the courage to seize it instead of opting to take the safe or more conventional path. And the decision to seize the moment is generally not driven by specific ideas of monetary or material gain, but generally in pioneering a solution or solving a problem. It's about being, they're generally not driven by money at all. They're driven about wanting to have impact in their lives, although they, many measure it by money, let's be honest. And unlike the dominant paradigm of the Silicon Valley founder, gumption is evident everywhere. It's in every community. It's just many times buried under layers and layers and layers of, of uh, what's the word, a lack of confidence. All right, so um, the book that's coming out will be um, focusing on what is gumption. So we'll be answering the first thing that we just did. We're gonna challenge, um, I'm gonna ch challenge myself to actually embed it in the American experience. What makes us different? Everyone comes to America for some reason, but let's really dig into what is that American dream, um, and is it available, and what is gumption? We're gonna talk about the mythology of Silicon Valley versus the everyday entrepreneur. We're gonna talk about gumption and the extraordinary, ordinary entrepreneur. Every profile in the book will be someone you've never heard of, who will have a outsized gumption story, one that will blow you away. We're gonna talk about the gumption function, which is ultimately exposing your inner entrepreneur, you know, getting to that uh, uh, testing of yourself and then the manifesto, dare yourself to give permission. Um, there are six layers of gumption that I saw, the six enemies of gumption. It starts out with the biggest cop out, and I've asked this now for 15 years. Why do you not start a company? I don't have a good idea. I'm like, ideas are a dime a dozen. We just found out that there's a book being written saying the idea is simple, or the idea is easy. Right, that's the easy part. The number two is I don't have the resources of capital to move forward. It's RBV, there's a whole body of literature on that. I have not acquired the skills and knowledge to become an entrepreneur. That's what we do. That's where we, we help overcome three and four, which is I've not had the experiences nor background to be an entrepreneur. Number five is I lack the creative confidence to become an entrepreneur, and that usually stops most people. Number five is really a killer one psychological factor. Number six, I cannot assume the risks required of entrepreneurship or the rewards do not offset this risk. By the way, have you ever thought, what is the antonym of the word risk? Security, Security safety, certainty. What's the other antonym of the word risk? Reward, right? That's the table stakes. That's something we should be talking about because certainty is the enemy of entrepreneurship. 
All right, so I'm gonna just finish up by saying um, these are tools that I have and we've been working through, we're gonna have about 400 different vignettes of very ordinary people in their junct uh, gumption functions. So this is a fellow who was in the military and he wasn't truly an entrepreneurial guy, but he came back with all his soldiers, he was a captain in the military, came back with all his soldiers alive and within two weeks of uh, being home, one of his soldiers committed suicide. And he's, I can't live with that. And he decided he would create an organization called Stop Soldier Suicide, and he did that. And he failed miserably doing that. And he learned about what, what, how not to do a nonprofit. It was highly unsuccessful, although everyone wanted to help him. Who wouldn't want to be behind that idea? But then he realized by working with multiple nonprofits that they all have this problem, that they can't source funding. They can't find a revenue stream. So he created Good United, which is now using social media to raise money for nonprofits. And it's one of the fastest growing companies in South Carolina. And he had three, two major gumption moments that were actually framed by huge failures. Here's a fellow that just would blow your hair back. It's a guy named Mike Mazur. You might not have heard, you might have heard of Mike. Mike was a C-level guy in three big companies. Uh, he, later in AOL, he was with, um, oh shoot, uh, Dig. Dig and AOL and Electronic Arts, EA. Big, big deal. He said he made so much money for entrepreneurs, but he was never an entrepreneur. And he made enough money, he finally said, uh, you know, with, with, after AOL, he said, you know, I just want to become an entrepreneur. And he went to his venture capital friends and said, give me some money. And three of them signed up and they gave him a couple million bucks each. And he started working on this idea and the idea didn't work. And uh, he ended up, um, I'm sorry I'm getting into this story. He's one of the most amazing gumption stories. Uh, and this will make the point more than anything. He um, went back to the VCs and said, I want to give the money back because this idea sucks and it's not going to work. And the VC said, I, I don't want the money back. You know, I, I wasn't betting, on, I knew the idea sucked. I was betting on you. You go figure out a better idea. So he literally sold his goods. He went to New Zealand, got in a van, went around New Zealand, he found out that his calling was human fitness. He loved being fit. And he came back with the idea for the, one of the wearable uh, softwares. He created a thing called Fitstar. And it, it was working, you know, was, he, and even at that point, he wouldn't have called himself an entrepreneur. He had built software tech, and he was literally uh, given a term sheet by Fitbit to buy it. A very generous deal. He found out he was feeling poorly, and he went in to the doctor, and he found out he had stage four lymphoma, and he was going to die. And he said, um, I've got to tell the Fitbit people that um, I'm going to die. And they um, ended up um, saying, we're gonna double down instead of bailing. You know, he was saying, you can get out of the deal. You know, you don't, you're not committed to the deal. He said, no, we're gonna actually do this deal and go forward. With that and the energy, he figured out using a, a, a technique called, uh, Vatalonga is the person who he followed. He figured out by fasting, he could slow down the metabolism or metabolomics of, of, the, of red blood cells. And basically with targeted chemo, chemotherapy and fasting, he was able to attack the, 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 the cells that were cancerous, and he was in complete remission. And it was out of his fitness journey that he realized that fasting and understanding fasting and the importance of fasting in the health experience is highly important. He doesn't make any medical claims of being able to solve cancer, but he believes that the metabolic changes he was able to implement with fasting, that's when he becomes self-realized as an entrepreneur. That was his true gumption moment. Think of a person who's sitting on his deathbed and then cures himself, and then starts now, his third act as an entrepreneur, he has the company uh, Big Sky Health, which is uh, the, the company that does Zero and Less and some of the other big apps in healthcare, human healthcare. Just an incredible gumption story. Um, so I'm working these vignettes now, and uh, the, the, we're collecting data, we're gonna be showing these different stories in different ways, and uh, it's gonna be data, and we're gonna be submitting uh, the results of a survey that we've done consistently across the board. So we've collected about 400 cases at this point, and some of them will be in the book, and we're going to actually build this out as a series of vignettes. Why am I doing this? Not to make, I, look, I'm, I'm irrelevant. I'm a, I'm, my, my career's over, you know? I'm at, uh, I've got 10 more years, maybe, professionally to be relevant. And that's only if you guys are kind to me, right? Um, uh, I want to help um, people see a relatable story. I don't want people to think Elon Musk is my model. 
because Elon Musk is almost certainly not your model. He might be a model to somebody, but I want somebody who's on the wrong side of the tracks or grew up in a tough neighborhood or maybe grew up in a tough family situation or have nothing to see someone relatable in their story. And that's why the vignettes are gonna be so powerful to make this conversion. So with that, I'm gonna just uh, um, uh, you know, break, break it down. I hope I gave you something to think about. I hope it was a nice way to kind of frame the conversation. And uh, if anyone's interested, please um, let me know. The book will be coming out in the fall. And then uh, we're going to be doing this gumption project for some time. I'd like to kind of make this a lifelong kind of process, a curing, curating stories of gumption, these outsized stories of gumption. Was that helpful? <laughs> oh, OK, before uh, Alex comes up and steals the microphone, I, I want to ask Lois. And Dave, is Dave upstairs still? Uh, Mike, Mike, come on up here. Uh, Jill is not here, right? Uh, Jeff Hornsby, come up, please. Lois, come up. We have a little presentation in, um, uh, for Dr. DeNoble. So you remember um, on the movie A Beautiful Mind, when uh, you know, their colleagues uh, were recognizing uh, the, the professor on their last year. Well, we've been colleagues of Alex Noble for a while, and um, we just took a picture yesterday, and we wanted to kind of um, uh, uh, recognize Alex. So Alex, could you come up and accept a gift on behalf of your colleagues, some of your colleagues? <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, so and I really appreciate the team for having done that. Uh, and putting that together, it's just a photo of some of the colleagues that have been part of this. And you know, uh, Alex has brought us and privileged us to be here in San Diego. It comes with uh, a way that will help um, uh, Alex kind of assuage any concerns about being a, a retired person. Uh, it comes with a, a, an alcohol subscription. So uh, for the really? for the for the next for the next quarter, you'll be getting six bottles of wine every month. Really? So, uh, <laughs> so your last your last few months at San Diego State will be very happy months. <laughs> Let's stand up and give a round of applause. Let's stand up and give a standing ovation. Let's give a standing ovation to this guy. You're unbelievable. I love you, buddy. You're unbelievable. <laughs> now you can have the mic. <laughs> Look at these people that are up on this, that were just up on this stage. Uh, these, are, these are people that I've spent my career with. Um, uh, these were my compatriots, uh, are my compatriots. Um, these are the people that gave me inspiration over so many years, and, and uh, they're here with me till the end, and uh, um, I don't know what to say, but <laughs> thank you, thank you. Oh, my goodness. Let's go great. I got a few things to say first. I got, there's a... You'll say other things Um That's amazing. Um, so this is, we're coming to the end of the ninth annual California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference. And uh, I just had this dream of bringing academics together or practitioners together uh, in a collegial atmosphere, in a boutique kind of a way, uh, but to come to my home for the last 40 years um, to exchange ideas and to build from here. And, and um, to see all of you out in the audience and to see my friends and Craig here out there and Emil, and I could just name every one of you here. Uh, but um, it's truly an honor for me. This has been a long journey. And um, I hope it'll, I believe it will continue in just a different form, a different iteration. That's, um, that's what I'm looking for. Um, I'd like to bring two people uh, up for a second. Jennifer, will you come up? And Muchtaba, will you come up? So I'm going to be stepping out of my role at the Lavin Entrepreneurship Center. And I'm going to turn this role over to 
on the operation side to you, Jennifer, and on the academic side to you, Muchtaba. And I remember when I joined the faculty at San Diego State in 1983, um, there was a gentleman, his name was Darrell Mitten, and um, he was teaching this class in entrepreneurship, and uh, he was about to retire, and he looked at me, and he said, I'd like to hand this to you. And he passed the torch of what he had accomplished in entrepreneurship at the time, which was amazing, and put it into my hands. And um, uh, I hope I've done a good job. I hope I've built something special here. And, um, I'd like you two to, um, I, I want to pass this on to you, which Taba, on the academic side, and you've got the opportunity to take it to new levels. Sure. And, I, I just hope I don't screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you won't. And Jennifer, you're going to run a great operations portion of the center. Um, and I just wanted to thank both of you publicly in front of this audience. Thank you so, so much. Thank uh, you. I mean, Thank you, Alex. I mean, everything you see here with regards to entrepreneurship, a lot of it has been built by Alex. He's been committed to this institution for 40 plus years. And I mean, the Lavin Entrepreneurship see, uh, Center that we see today is because of his hard work. I'm, I'm just amazed at the amount of work and the number of projects that he's involved with. And I'm just like, sometimes I feel overwhelmed. Like, I'm like, how, how do we keep up with it? How do you keep up with it, Alex? <laughs> And I, I'm glad that I have Jennifer with me at the operation because it's certainly not a one man's uh, like job that that Alex has done. Like Alex has been pretty much running the center solely for the last 18 months, I think, with the help of excellent student assistant uh, that he has. But uh, you know, it's not a one person's job. Uh, and I'm glad that I have Jen and even Kathy Putcher to work with. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, but we'll talk more. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, so what would you think of the California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference? Um, I would like uh, our staff to come up here, Sarah and uh, Mariana and Riyadari and Caleb. Come on up. Come on up. Let me tell you something. Look, uh, these, are, these are students that work in our entrepreneurship center. And um, well, this one over here, uh, I said, well, I don't think I'm up for doing the educators conference this year. And she would have none of it. <laughs> she would have none of it. <laughs> and and uh, we had bantered back and forth the whole time. Um, but with this staff and um, uh, with, uh, where's Anna? She's, Over in, she's on her way. And, uh, okay, <laughs> and Tammy. But um, these students are, are my pride and joy working with you this, this year. And um, uh, Sarah was our general along with Anna, who will hopefully be here. Um, Caleb and Ayman were part of the videography team. Uh, that I'm going to show you in a minute. And uh, uh, how about all of the graphics, the signs out there, and uh, all of the. Mariana Solaris, our graphic designer extraordinaire. And, and, and none of this happens without the numbers, <laughs> keeping track of the accounting and um, all of the financials. Um, I had a two person team, and um, Yudari. Thank you so much for keeping track of the numbers for us and keeping us innocent here. So thank this staff. They're just incredible. And if anybody's looking to hire any of them, they're available. No, you're not available until next year. And uh, Tammy, who runs her own company, a sponsor, used to be up here to run it as a student. Thank you. And I want to thank all of our sponsors. Um, Emil, thank you for 
uh, your support. Mark, I know you're here, and uh, I don't know if the East Bay people are here, and I just, you know, but. Um, <laughs> Oh, you are. There they are, the East Bay people. I didn't see you out there, but thank you. Uh, you're making this possible for us as well. So um, uh, before we close, before we close, um, now we have a special affinity at San Diego State um, for March Madness. <laughs> we have a special affinity for uh, anybody ever hear of the, the final four? <laughs> anybody ever hear of the, the final two? <laughs> um, so I explained, so I, I, I asked our videography team, uh, which Caleb and Alex back here, my two videographers, and Iman, you're part of the team. They've been interviewing you throughout the conference. And I had to explain to them that at the end of March Madness every year, they do this thing called One Shining Moment. And I issued them a challenge in, on Thursday, and I have no idea <laughs> what we're going to see. <laughs> but, um, um, I guess I can't call this one shining moment. I guess that's, uh, that's uh, there's an IP around that or something, or it's trademarked. Um, but I'm thinking about uh, a moment to remember for the California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference uh, 2023. So, uh, you ready? Hit it. <laughs> Let's see what we got. trip is really one of the main reasons I like to come to this event. I came in 2019 and then, you know, there were three years of virtual sit back in person. Two wineries in the valley of Guadalupe, the wine valley in Baja. We went to the club the Empresario in Tijuana, which is an entrepreneur's club. And we went to a restaurant called Splash to watch the sunset um, and hear the story of the owner and kind of founder of that. So it was a lot of a uh, lot, a long day. It was a great, great trip. Uh, probably the end of the day when we were at the splash bar and uh, watching the sunset, drinking some nice wine and got to know everyone by that point so it was good to have a chat with everyone and enjoy the full day. my very first CEC. Every conference that I attend, I learn a little bit more on how to approach the community and learners around entrepreneurship, uh, updated uh, approaches and tools, uh, what educators from all across the country are using to inspire, to engage, to uplift for students and, and the community to be engaged with this world of entrepreneurship.
One of the things that I learned throughout these days were uh, actually practical tools that I could implement in, uh, in art classes at, at the universities I represent. Uh, and also, I think as a young scholar and a young uh, uh, professional in this field, it's been so inspiring to hear from top scholars and people who've been really uh, changing and shaping uh, this, uh, this industry and also this academic field. Uh, so also having uh, conversations with them about how to maybe what to prioritize in your career and uh, how to um, segment the different things you're doing and make sure that there is this holistic synergy uh, between all of the things uh, an academic person could do. So that has been invaluable. And I have to say that um, the fact that this conference is so uh, well organized and, and relatively smaller than uh, bigger conferences really makes it possible for people to connect at another level and even to share these uh, life lessons. <laughs> Come on up here. Ayman, get up here. That was our videography team pulling that together. Thank you, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> to be honest, the staff pulled me aside yesterday and said, can we relax this challenge? <laughs> they, were, they were concerned. But wow, you did it, man. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, and if you're so inclined, we got a little entertainment. And um, uh, I think it's beer and wine now. <laughs> um, right upstairs, I mean, follow us. We'll lead you to the second floor for a little closing celebration. Come on upstairs and join us.